Well, here we are. Leonardo DiCaprio may have went down with the Titanic not too long after he went down on uh, Kate Blanchett, but the, the show, The Velocity of Now, is not going to go down tonight. Despite the technical problems, we are here. This is me, Thomas Sheridan, your host for tonight. We're going to run the show over late, thanks to uh, Steve over there, the producer, who's gl- happily and very co- graciously compensating for the technical problems to produce the show for a further hour. So we will have the full two-show hour of The Velocity of Now tonight. My name is Thomas Sheridan. My website is www.thomassheridanarts.com. Hopefully it still exists. And the radio web show is vonradio.net, vonradio.net. Now, tonight I was going to talk about mystical and magical things, and I don't know what, and, and some other things as well. It's a very packed show tonight. And I'm going to be talking about, God, everything, right? It's really going to be a packed show tonight. The first thing is, you know me and UFOs, okay? Uh, I, You know, we had Adam on from the Glasgow Truth Group thing a few weeks ago, a few, not a few months ago now, talking about UFOs and things like that. And I made it quite clear, and he kind of believes me, that I'm not into the whole alien thing, visitation stuff, I don't believe it. However, I do believe people when they tell these stories. I think in many, most cases, it's probably a, super, a natural or a engineered or some kind of other uh, military machine that they're seeing or something. Or maybe it's a phenomenon that we haven't discovered yet, which is kind of like where I'm somehow leading to. And I think it's related to human consciousness. But anyway, this week, by happenstance, a friend of mine who was about as – lovely fella, though, lovely smart fella – He's about as woken up as Sleeping Beauty. He's no interest in any stuff uh, out there, no interest in anything to do with paranormal stuff. Called me up to tell me of these strange lights he saw in County Cabin. Now, County Cabin is on the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. It's, uh, it's, it's actually part of Ulster, but it belongs to the Republic. So it has that. It's always it's kind of a border banded country. It always has that reputation, and the county is odd in the in the sense that the north, the southern part of the county is really within the Dublin commuter belt. So people actually would commute from there to Dublin if they were mad. The, the two hour drive or two and a half hour drive. In the northern part, it's wild. I remember back in the eighties when back in the early eighties, I was like very young. I was about seventeen. Uh, Jesus, barely even that. A friend of mine had a band who were playing up, and I think it was in Derry, and we we somehow drove through Cavan, and it was like the most wild and desolate and remote place I'd ever seen. It was literally driving through these mountains that were on the border that like meandered forever and ever, and I'll never forget how inhospitable the terrain was. It was just brown, muddy, soggy, horrible grass. And uh, not even grass, like rushes, and it was just like, and it was, it was pissing rain that day. And I remember thinking to myself, it was probably the most depressing place I'd ever been to in my life. But I mean, that was just like my back introduction to it. But however, it did feel very creepy to me. Now, and this is the northern part of the county, the, the, the remoter part. And uh, so anyway, my friend calls me up and says he got up, he got up one morning. You know, this is I think it was on Wednesday or Thursday. He calls me up and he says he was going out to the car and it was a chilly morning, but it was clear. And he looked over behind the mountains near his house and he saw these lilac colored lights. He said they kind of appeared from inside the mountain. They came from from inside, inside the mountain and they moved outwards as if they were coming, emerging from the mountain. And then, OK, that, you could say that was a that was a, you know, a natural thing, plasma or something like that. And then they began to moving from, he said, he said, right to left along the mountain, the side of the mountain. And then he, when he said, when he said, he, he said to himself in his head, what the hell is that? It suddenly changed direction on 90 degree angle and started going upwards. And he jokingly said to me as if it was, uh, as if he had controlled it. This is very significant stuff. Now, he said that the lights were emerging from the mountain, moving and then going up. M- emerging from the mountain, moving across and moving over. He told me something else. He said that even though the light was a bright lilac, almost like a flare or an arc from an arc welder's torch, there was no throw to the light in that 
it wasn't illuminating the trees on the hillside. It was a, a light by itself. Turns out then that not only did other people in that part of Cavan see these lights, these strange lights moving along the mountains on that morning, but also in the mountains of Morn, which was over in the, a few counties over in County Down in Northern Ireland. And now one of my friends tonight on Facebook tells me that similar kind of lights were seen in Cumbria directly across the Irish Sea at the same time in England, the north of England, the northwest of England, I think Cumbria is, yeah. So it would probably be along, it probably, in terms of latitude, along the same backboard place. Now, is this some kind of, some kind of seismic activity? Well, it doesn't sound like it. Not, it doesn't sound, not that the light can turn at a, a perfect 90 degree angle. And that's, that's what people reported. And my friend even said to me that it seemed like this thing was alive. And that was very commonly reported by people who've seen these lights over the years. They always talk about how the lights seem more like an animal than a machine. Like they think they seem like that they're alive. They have a consciousness. They have their awareness about them. And Adam, that we had from Glasgow Truth Group, spoke about this a few weeks ago as well. Interesting, interesting stuff. And it's something I want to get up there and have a look at if I can. Now, I live beside some very spooky mountains as well. And I have seen these kinds of weird lights up there. And I used to say, sometimes you, you will get a tractor in a field being driven by a farmer that's very high up. And, but you'll know, you know what a tractor is like when it moves and trucks, you know, and these were not like tractors. But also, I'm going to try and get photographs this week. I used to go hiking in these mountains a lot. Some of the mountains near where I live are quite remote on the top. There's even like lakes up there that were full of fish that you, you know, you can't even get to. But on the top of one of the mountains, about four years ago, something very strange happened. A lane I used to hike up, uh, up into a quite a remote part of the hill, suddenly had what looked like a very official looking fence. The fence was, you know, it's like something you'd see on a military base or something you would see around a, a police station or an industrial site. So it wasn't something a farmer put off. And I had very specific instructions about do not enter, do not come in here, do not go here, and this kind of thing. Now, there are quarries and logging companies up in these mountains, and there's quite a big quarry in a few places. So I, I assume that's what it was when I saw this sign. And I went up and through the gate and got to the summit of the mountain. And what had happened literally was the whole top of the mountain had been cleared off and leveled down to the bedrock. I mean, flat, leveled like they're going to build a construction site on it. Now this is a thousand, this is this is a couple of thousand feet up in the sky. So no one was going to live there. No one was going to build a, a, a factory or something like that. There's no way you would get power or anything. Well, you could, but I mean, I mean incredibly expensive. But the, the top of the mountain was completely leveled off, okay? And there had been people working there because I saw the, the remains of the, the sort of the, the digger part of a digging machine, an excavation machine. You know, that the way they, they think there's like a pivot pin that pulls them off so they can change them different types. And a very big one of them was just left up there on the side. And whatever been up there, whatever machines, I don't even know how they got the machines up there. Because uh, the roads are crap. I mean, they really are. And they would have had it to move an enormous amount of rubble out of there by truck. And there's no way you can get a truck up there. No way. And this area on the top is also filled with white quartz. I have a huge piece of white quartz that I got up from there years ago. So during the summer, I went up and had a look at the site again. And it looked like they were building something. And then they abandoned it. And it was always where I saw these lights at night. And these lights were not on the mountain. They were around it, moving. So if anyone has any speculation of that i might have older photographs somewhere but i am due a trip up there to videotape it because i want i want there's something goes on up in mountains that we're not told about especially i think there's some kind there's a lot of kind of weird projects and weird sort of things are tested up in these away from eyes and out out of sight out of mind and out you know out of sight and out of mind but it's it seems to take place around mountains in this part of the world. It always seems to be in the mountains. You know, Ben Bolden is not far from here, the, the mystical mountain of William Butler Yeats. And 
there was always stories going back, and Yates used to believe, and so do some of the old timers around there, that inside the mountains up there around Glen Carr and all those like Knocknashe, the hill of the, the fairies, which I can see from my window right now. Well, it was daytime; it, was, it wasn't dark outside. And of beings that live inside these mountains, and these beings are called the gentry, like you know, spelled the same way as like you know rich people, G E N T or Y. And the gentry are considered where in the folklore around this part of the world as a highly sophisticated and described almost as an Aryan looking race who had about the 1700s left the mountains and gone to assimilate with human beings. They'd moved to Dublin, but they'd also moved to other European cities like Vienna and Paris. And they would look like humans, dress like humans, and accept that when you would talk to them, you would be aware that they were very, very educated, very charming and very likable. And they had a stature about them that was very hard to explain. And they had an energy and a presence. Now, you've heard me talk in the past about how psych a lot of psychopaths I've encountered in my working life when I was in Wall Street had an energetic resonance about them. That was it almost made me feel like my physiology would, was breaking down when I was even just near them after a while, like the energy vampirism thing, like I was going to fall out of my shoes. Well, I've ha I, I, you know, I had an experience once also on the subway in New York where I was, I think I was getting the, tra it might have been, it might have been the, tra the number one train from the World Trade Center up to Penn Station, and it was at Torrey Torch Street Station, and on the station. A guy who looked like a regular Asian-looking guy got on the, the, the subway train. I was standing in the middle of the, the vestibule area holding the pole on, on the subway. He got in there beside me, and I was overcome by a horrific sense that this was the devil next to me. That was the feeling. The feeling was I was next to the devil. I was next to the devil, Okay. Uh, I, I don't even, and this is the time when I was like an atheist. I didn't believe in that stuff, and so that's always stuck with me. Now, but I've also had speaking of these gentry, the effect once in my life of encountering a being, a person that seemed like an angel to me or a being, and it was right here in County Sligo where the gentry were supposed to come from, and it happened right after nine one one while. At a very difficult time in my life, I was standing in the train station going to Dublin one afternoon, a beautiful summer's day, and I was looking down at the tracks, okay, and waiting for the train, just lost in my thoughts, and this gentleman came over to me that was like, he, he looked like he was about seven foot tall. He was elderly, but not old. He was elderly and very, very fit. Uh, he was very well dressed. He was very his presentation about him was immaculate. He had this he had the opposite energy of this 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 devil that got on the train next to me. It was an energy of him beside me. Just I just felt like the world was a better, a more decent and a more a more a more likable place. Just was a better a better world. And he he said to me, and I'll never forget this. You know when the train travels along the tracks, that the, the, the wheels of the train don't actually touch the rail. There's a, there's a microscopic gap between the two. And I says, yeah, I know, because there really is no matter as such. It's, you know, when you get down to the subatomic le level, it's just radio waves. So there would just be two radio particles at the, at, the, at the most brushing by each other without touching. And he goes, oh, I know you know all about that stuff. That's all particle physics and everything. And I says, yeah, you interested in that? And I was surprised he said that. And he goes, I'm very interested in everything, he says. And I'm very interested in that the fact that you knew this. And he, this, this, guy was, this guy was just like not a person to me. Now, I don't believe in angels or anything like that. But that's what I felt like I was around. I felt like I was around some kind of superhuman. And now looking, and then when the train came in, and I said goodbye, he said goodbye. He got on one carriage, I got on the other, and I never saw him ever again. And maybe he didn't get on the train. I just got on the train door and it was the last time I was on. I just said I had a nice day and I got on the train. But it got me thinking about the gentry that were of the myth around here and how they're described, because that's exactly what he was, a sophisticate that didn't seem human and seemed to possess an enormous power. 
At the same time, I'm hearing – and they came from the mountains around here. I'm hearing all about these lights, and I'm hearing about the lights in the mountains of Morn, which is also an interesting place as well because there's a place there called the Valley of the Winds. Um, or the the, the the wind the wind valley or the valley of the storm or something like that. I'll find this out later. Where at the height of the Great Famine in the 1840s, a huge wind blew through the valley, and and locals believed that it blew all the magic and the fairies out of the valley. Now Cumbria in the north of England would be of a similar kind of cultural tradition. That's where you know the art. There was a lot of move. The Scotty from Ireland would have went over to. Is something happening, folks? Is is a sh- I don't you know I don't want to get philosophical about it, but are the ancestors returning to tell us something? And just by chance, just by chance, are, are we having what they call an adjustment, a vindication of our intuition, a vindication of our connection with the spirit, a vindication? of the, the, the curves and the transient past between us in the present 21st century and a kind of a wisdom that our ancestors have. Now today, just saying that, I want to read you this fabulous article. It's actually a book review. It showed up in today's uh, Sunday Telegraph, the English version. And... Uh, it's on the online version. I'll put links to it later on, the usual show page, VO, on VON.net. And this article written by Tim Martin, which is really a book, it is a book review. And it's about a hardcore skeptical archaeologist in England who's decided that the Druids and the, the so called wisdom that they're kind of like, you know, us and the kind of like people who are interested in the paganism and all that stuff, he's basically saying, in terms of ley lines and everything, he's basically saying the Druids were probably right and the Romans suppressed all this. And us who were the nutcases who believed in all these things like ley lines and there was a mystical connection between the structures on the earth and the stars in the sky and our Druid ancestors knew this. Well, this guy is, is basically saying that it's true and the Romans suppressed it. And let me read this article, The Ancient Path, Discovering the Lost Map a map of Celtic Europe, reviewed by Tim Martin. Tim Martin has his eyes opened by an enthralling new history that argues that Druids created a sophisticated ancient society to rival the Romans. And that's in today's Telegraph. Important, if true, was the phrase that the 19th century writer and historian Alexander Kindlake wanted to see engraved above a church doors. It rings loud in the ears as one reads the latest book by Graham Robb. A biography and history, uh, biographer and historian of distinction whose new work, if everything in it proves to be correct, could blow apart two millennia of thinking about Iron Age Britain and Europe and put several scientific discoveries back centuries. Rigorously field tested by its skeptical author who observes that anyone who writes about the Druids and mysteriously coordinated landscape or claims to have located the intersections of the solar paths of Middle Earth and in particular in, in a particular field street railway station or cement quarry must expect to be treated with superstition. It presents extraordinary conclusions in a deep, persuasive and uncompromising manner. What sources from these elegant pages, if true, is nothing less than a wonder of the ancient world, the first solid evidence of Druidic science and its accomplishments, and the earliest accurate map of the continent. Now, why this is so important, folks, is that apart from the fact that a mainstream academic coming out and saying, oh, you, you know, you pagan and Celtic pe- people who said that our ancient ancestors were far more sophisticated than the Romans said, not only is he saying that's true, but it's also telling us something else is going on here, that maybe hardcore reduction of science is finally getting the kick up the hole it always deserved, and we're actually going to get some, you know, some non kind of like British Empire, Roman Empire, academic prejudice. See, there's nothing, we know nothing about the Druids. That's one of the great tragedies. Nothing. The only record, I have a Penguin book from the 1960s, which is actually quite a scholarly book, even though it's a Penguin book, but it, 
in, before we it was published before the New Age stuff and all that kind of thing, and Theosophy and Druidism and all that kind of stuff. It quite clearly lays out that even in the book, everything they knew about the the Druids was pure and total speculation, complete speculation, and or there was some very interesting insights and information that could be garnished from the Irish the Irish annals annals sorry annals and the Irish annals A N L A L S right. They were, although I think it is pronounced annals, don't don't quote me on that, were written in the 14th century. So they're, they're, they're you know, they're set, they're, they're, you know, you're talking about thousands and thousands of years after the Druids were gone. However, they were, you know, taken from an oral tradition, and it's been shown, in especially in India, that an oral tradition tends to be more accurate than a written tradition. Because when tales are told in a folky way or in a story way or in a song or a poem or in a bardic manner, you can't change the words, especially if it has to rhyme. So anyway, I'll continue with this article. Rob begins his journey from a cottage in Oxfordshire, following up on a handful of mysteries that teasingly occurred as he assembled his prize-winning travelogue, The Discovery of France. They had to do with the Heraclean Way, an ancient route that runs 1,000 miles in a straight line from the tip of the Iberian Peninsula in the Alps, and with several Celtic settlements called Mediolanium arranged at intervals along its route. After examining satellite images difficult for the private scholar even a decade ago, and making several more research trips, Rob bumped up against two extraordinary discoveries. First, the entire Via Heraclea runs as a straight as an arrow along an angle from the rising and setting sun at the solstice. Secondly, plotting lines through the Celtic Mendiolanum settlements results in lines on the map onto sections of a Roman road, which themselves point not to Roman towns, but at a Celtic Opidia further along. You see, this is really incredible stuff this guy's pulling out here now. I'm just going on the article. Viewed in this light, the ancient text of the Italian conquerors begins to reveal sidelong secrets about the people they supplanted. Piece by piece, there emerges a map of the ancient world constructed along precise celestial lines. Now remember, we're talking about mainstream academics here. This is the stuff you could go into places like Glastonbury and find tons of books on this, and they were considered by the mainstream to be the works of nutjobs. However, here's a, a mainstream guy saying it's true. A huge network of meridians and solar axes that serve as a blueprint for Celtic colonization of Europe dictated the placement of settlements and places of worship and was then almost wholly wiped off history from history. We are, to put it mildly, unused to thinking like this about the Celts, whose language is defunct and whose reputation was comprehensively rewritten by those who succeed them. That was the Greeks and the Romans. Greek travelers from the 6th century BC onwards described the nation of sanguinary brutes and madmen who threw their babies into rivers, walked on their swords into the sea, and roughly sodomized their guests. It does not take an an anthropologist to suspect, Rob observes, that what the travelers saw or heard about these baptismal rites, the ceremonial dedications of weapons to gods of the lower world, and the friendly custom of sharing one's bed with a stranger. You see, that's interesting too, because even in Ireland, in the eight, even up to the 80s in Ireland, if I stayed in a friend's house, I wouldn't sleep in a sofa, I'd often sleep in his bed. That was not considered anything gay, or two straight guys would, you know, would sleep in the same bed if there was only one bed available. And I wonder, was that a leftover of those times? It wouldn't be considered like gay, or it wasn't, it wouldn't come to your mind, it was that. I thought men now. They would, you just go, it was a bed, it's big enough for the two of us, we're two fellas, and we'll just go asleep. And you wonder if that goes back to this kind of uh, custom that the, the Greeks and the Romans were so uppity about, homoph- homophobic about, because maybe it was bad. And it's ironic, the Greeks of all people saying that. That's a, that's a good one, the ancient Greeks. I don't mean to insult the Greek people, I mean the ancient Greeks. Later on, clean-shaven, toga-sporting Roman visitors to what they called Galicia Baraka and Galicia Comata, uh, Gaul and Harry, Trousered Gaul and Harry Gaul, respectively, were horrified by the inhabitants' practical, practical legwear and love of elaborate moustaches, and marveled to hear them discoursing not in a gnarly Gaulish, but in perfect Greek. A 
As the Roman military machine rolled over Europe, depicting the Celt as a once dwelling wild man, became not just a matter of Italian snobbery, but one of propagandist utility. According to Rob, when the Romans arrived on this side of the Alps, they found the countries whose technical achievements were different from, but competitive with their own. You see, this is a meme through history, a maxim, that they, they would arrive and see a different kind of technology and then automatically make the assumption that it was wrong. You see that with things like dowsing. And, you know, you have, you know, dowsers will find water sources in a field. And then you have water drilling companies who destroy the environment by drilling a hole down until they find a water source. Meanwhile, a dowser can do it and a farmer can dig a hole and get it just like that. But because the dowser just uses two rods, He's considered to be either a fake, a fraud, fruity, or the technology doesn't work. But it does work. The dowsing rods do work in locating water. But because it's not a machine that goes, makes a lot of noise, uses a lot of petrol, diesel or diesel, and costs, you know, a couple of hundred dollars, euros to rent every an hour, it's an inferior technology. And the same thing happened when the Romans and the Greeks met the Celts. They had, the Celts had a different technology, okay? They had a different technology, but it wasn't an inferior technology. And that's a very important thing to consider. Oh, and dowsing, Steve is reminding me that dowsing doesn't only take out water. It can find all kinds of other things. Now, as the Roman, I've got to that. Now, next, moving on. Math then governed by a network of scholarly priests according to a template laid down in heaven, covered by a road network that afforded swift passage of fleets uniquely of uniquely advanced chariots. Nearly all the Latin words for wheeled vehicles, Rob notes, come from the Gaulish. That's another one thing, too, too that the, the Celts were not supposed to build roads. That is not true at all. There are Celtic roads that are built not of stone, but of oak, oak and ash uh, logs. That would be laid out. They found an enormous one in uh, in County Longford in a bog in Ireland, which has been preserved, and it's a beautiful place to visit. There's a beautiful museum they built around it. But they've now reckoned that these wooden roads stretched all over Europe. Just think about the practicalities of that. As a time that Europe was was completely covered in woods, if you just wanted to repair a Celtic road or a Gaulish road. He knocked down the nearest tree, stripped off the branches, and threw it on the road. And then probably put some kind of wattle and daub on top of that to smoothen the surface. Again, it wasn't an inferior technology, the Roman road system of building roads with stone. It was just different. And possessing astronomical and scientific knowledge that would take another millennium to surface again. Gaul remained a deeply enigmatic place to its military-minded conquerors. When Julius Caesar swept through true on a tide of warfare and genocide that would lead his countryman Pilony to accuse him of human generis in Uara, crimes against humanity, most of this knowledge retreated to the Greenwood and never to emerge. Most significantly, Rob suggests, Caesar failed to work out the Druids. To most of us even now, the word conjures up an image of a white robe seer with a sickle and an implausible hybrid, hybrid of getafix and Glastonbury hippie. That's an interesting one. I don't know if Americans or Canadians or other non-Europeans know about this, but it was a cartoon series in the 60s. It's still going, actually. And it was made to a few movies about the Roman conquest of Gaul. And the name of the, the Celtic Druid priest was Getafix. Now, what was interesting about that cartoon is it, it, it shows the Romans as being completely incompetent, like Homer Simpson types. And the the, the, the Druids always getting run up on them, always making fun of them, always having superior technology and magic and everything else, and always having parties. And the creator of that cartoon was actually a Frenchman of Italian descent. You wonder if there was something in his collective memory or in his genetic memory that made him kind of uh, atone, shall we say, for the the destruction of the the Gaulish, Celtic and Druidic aspects of history. Rob suggests, following design on a Gaulish cauldron, that they tended more towards figure-hugging costume patterns like oak bark, much better for melting like, melting like smoke into the trees, a trait of Druid-led armies that Caesar vigor, vigorously deplored. What he means there is that they had phenomenal ways of camouflaging themselves while, while in wars and stuff like that. When you think about it, that makes perfect sense. 
why, you know, if you were a druid, why would you dress up in white like uh, Get the Fix or, or Gandalf? You would dress up like John Barleycorn or the Green Man to blend in with your, your background. The Druidic curriculum took two decades to train up its initiates, but these men of science put nothing in writing. Like their wood-built houses and their roads, their, secret, their secrets rotted with time. How could we cope to reconstruct them? Remarkably, Rob has the answer to this and it forms the centre of a book almost indecently stuffed with discoveries. One of the most consistently baffling things about Celtic temple sites to modern surveyors is their shape. Warped rectangular rectangles that seem nonetheless to demonstrate a kind of systematic irregularity. Using painstakingly reconstructed elements of the Druidic education, which placed religious emphasis on mapping the patterns of the heavens onto the lower middle earth of our world, Rob comes up with an astonishing discovery. These irregular rectangles exactly match a method for constructing a geometrical ellipse, the image of the sun's course in the heavens. Such a method was previously thought to be unknown until the West, until the 1950s. The Druids, 3,000 years ago, incredibly were aware that the sun rotated around the, that the earth rotated around the sun, or the sun rotated around the earth to them, whatever it was, and how they saw it, on an elliptical orbit, not a perfect circle. So they were, 3,000 years ago, the Celtic Druids were advanced in science as, you know, they were aware of Kepler's third law of motion, essentially, that wasn't discovered until the Renaissance. Other suggestions follow thick and fast, backed by a mixture of close reading, mathematical construction, and scholarly detective work. Building on meridians and equinoctial lines, the Druids used their maps of the heavens to create a map that crisscrossed the continent, providing a plan of sufficiently latitudinal and longitudinal accuracy to guide the Celtic diaspora as it pushed eastwards across to Europe. You take the high road, I'll take the low road. The swirls and pa- hey, that's another one, isn't that that's a good one to think about? The swirls and patterns in Celtic art turns out, Rob has summarized, to be arranged along rigorous mathematical principles. Well, of course they are. Someone does Celtic art myself. I can tell you that the Celtic art is essentially what people call sacred geometry. And may even encode the navigational and cartographic secrets that the Druid so laboriously developed. There's always been this, this statement, this assumption, and some people have worked on it, that the Celtic cross was actually a navigational design pointing out the four coordinates. And that was its origin. It was, a, it was almost like a sextant on a ship used to coordinate longitude and latitude. Rob manages in his revelations with a showman skill, modestly conscious that the book is unfolding a map of Iron Age Europe and Britain that have been inaccessible for millennia. Every page produces new solutions to all mysteries, some of them so audacious that the reader may laugh out loud, proposing a new location for Uxiliundum, the site of the Gauls finally losing battle in France. In one thing, it's one thing suggesting where to look for King Arthur's court or which lake to drag for Excelibur is quite another, but there are both are here. This is incredible stuff. Amid such riches, there are readers of The Discovery of France, a glorious book that makes notes from the modern cycling tour with a historical gazette of pre-unification France, may still be itching for the moment when the author gets back on his bike. Beautifully written though it is, the ancient paths can tend to, to dryness at times, but some of its best moments come when the author gets out into the field. One example will suffice. Certain references in Caesar's writing indicate that the Gauls operated a vocal telegraph composed of strategically placed teams yodeling news overland to one another, which passed messages at a speed nearly equivalent to the first Chappé telegraph in the 18th century. To judge how this might have worked, Rob takes himself off to the upper them above our arm you count, near uh, Clermont Ferrand, Ferrand, where he reports on the car alarms and the wear of traffic still audible across the countryside miles away. I, I, I've heard car alarms and house alarms going off miles away from the mountains that near here to Oven on the top of, where the nearest building was miles away. This shows you how much noise pollution we, we don't understand or know what the natural world is like because of noise pollution. Try to imagine yourself three thousand or even, you know, before the pre industrial area, how sounds could travel across a countryside with no industry and no noise and no traffic. It makes perfect sense, this uh 
this theory. He goes further. It was one of around 75 places once known by the name Ekoranda, Rekoranda, a word which, with an unknown root that resembles the Greek or Gaulish for sound like or call like. All the Ekoranda settlements Rob turns out, Rob visits, turned out to be on low ridges or shallow valleys, and would, he writes, have made excellent listening posts. Examined in this light, one word in Caesar's account becomes fruitful. He observed that the Gauls transmit the news by shouting across fields and regios. A word can be translated as boundaries. <coughs> Excuse me. An ancient Persian technique for acoustic surveying, still currently in the 19th century south of France, involves three men calling to one another and plotting their position along a direction of the sound putting the pieces together and you end up, or Rob does, with the scattered remains of a magnificent network that could have acted just like as a telegraph system, but by means to map the Druid's boundary on the earth, onto the earth. It is a magnificent piece of historical conjecture, backed by a quizzical scholarly intellect and gives a personal twist by experiment. So for that matter is, the whole thing Rob describes in his introduction, the secretive meeting with publishers in London and New York, that kept the lid on the book's research until publication, and watching its conclusions percolate through popular and academic history promises to be thrilling. He had to keep it quiet because he would have probably been stopped by academics and historians had he known had he had they known what he was working on. What does that tell you about the peer process and academic censorship? Reading it already an electrifying reading it is already an electrifying and uncanny experience. Is there something glorious and mo- unmodern about seeing a whole world new perspective on history? So comprehensively birthed in a single book, if true, very important indeed. And that was Tim Martin's review of The Ancient Paths, Discovering the Lost Map of Celtic Europe. And I'm definitely ordering this book the next time I have a few quid. It sounds fantastic. It sounds like the book we have been waiting for to vindicate books that non-academics or people interested in Celtic, Druidic, ancient studies, you know, the old, what was that book, the, 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 the old straight path or whatever, ley lines, it's all coming into place now. It, what else has been, what else has been denied to us by academia? You really do have to wonder. Fantastic. That was Ista and Knox Cafe. That was just fantastic. And synchronistic, synchronistically, I did not expect that kind of bass Celtic sound to come on following that story of that review of that book. Now, this is the philosophy of now. Thomas Sheridan Arts, www.thomasheridanarts.com. You can support me by buying my books, uh, sharing my articles. And if you want to throw me a few quid, that's great too. Whatever you want to do, try and you know let's 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 keep this thing on the on the road. Now the show is running late, but unfortunately, if you're listening live, it's still then in twenty minutes. However, the full two hour show will still be available in podcast. So, Raji, if you're listening to this, hold off on making the YouTube video. I'll contact you when I have the full podcast. So, the two hour show will still be available tonight, but I'll only be around. Uh, for the for the full two hour show, I, well, it's three hours really. Did yes, as Steve has just said, but be a full two hour show. Whatever you'll get to hear a normal broadcast in the course of time. You know, we 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 were late tonight, but we're back on track with the determination of uh, Char, uh, Charlie Sheen's nose heading towards a line of coke. Now, back with the show. I published an article that I wrote today, and it's on, if you go to my website, thomasshardenarts.com, and click the the blog link, um, I'll read this article to you now because it leads me into the next story about fear conditioning, controlling people through anxieties, and what they've done to us, and why we are such a fearful people now compared to our ancestors. Our ancestors didn't run around living in terrifying and go to their politicians and going, oh, save us, what will we do next? What will we do next? Help us, help us, help us. Politicians have conditioned us to be like this. Corporations and everyone else, religion has conditioned us to be like this because they've made childhood 
a joke. In the past, people read their, their children dark stories at an early age. This was to teach them that the world was not all sugar pups and lollipops. Now, that was taken away from people and it was done by Disney. But at the same time, they have distorted the Western psyche to sexualize children, in particular young girls, and make them women at a much grown women at a much, much earlier age. And the reason for this is to get money out of them. But they haven't sexualized boys just yet, but they will get there. But they're doing it to girls because girls, they want girls buying makeup and clothes and fashion at the earliest age possible. And that's why they've sexualized girls at an earlier age. They've made the boys, on the other hand, terrified and afraid of the dark. And this article I wrote tonight is called How Disney Destroyed the Western Psyche. In his 1976 book, The Uses of Enchantment, Austrian-born American psychologist Bruno Bettelheim demonstrates that fairy tales in the traditional format and narrative are more like mirrors into the darker aspects of our childhood. We as adults tend to think that children are all pure and innocent when nothing could be further from the truth. Childhood is filled with fears and aggressions. Bettelheim explained how a fairy tale is a vital tool for children to cope with the unresolved darker aspects of childhood, cultivating compassion and empathy for the downtrodden, creating a sense of responsibility to intervene in the oppression of others from an early age. For example, in the original version of Jack and the Beanstalk, the story can be stripped down to the basic premise of a hero clandestinely riding into a man's house, hiding in a man's house, while playing on his wife's sympathies in order to rob and finally murder the owner. Now, that's a psychopath. Now, let's re-examine all childhood fairy tales in the light of this darker understanding. They all have this underlying acceptance of the darker aspects of the human condition. They wear the mirror before the mirror neurons were discovered. And your mirror neurons in your brain are actually what control compassion and empathy. Now, empathy and compassion are often mixed up. They're two different things. Empathy just means an understanding with the people around you. Mirror neurons and psychopaths are switched off. There's a video I posted tonight about that showed like people doing, risking their lives and doing incredible things to save the lives of strangers. And the first person on the video is a platform guard at some train station somewhere, some metro station somewhere. And a man either falls or jumps onto the train and the station guard incredibly at the last second rescues the man from the train hitting them. And what makes this so very interesting is that if you watch that video, the platform guard kind of seizes the guy without even acknowledging he's about to jump. That was the mirror neurons firing. A human being knew one of his fellow human beings was in danger and risked his own life impulsively and instinctually to rescue his friend. Or his, no, it's a complete stranger, sorry. And that's human beings. That's what we're really like. And back to the article, as I've pointed out in my own book, Defeat the Demons, Freedom from Consciousness, Parasites, and Psychopathic Society. The underlying metaphor of the most of most children's fairy tales is to warn us of psychopath, psychopaths and pedophiles. The telling us of these fairy tales in a pre-Disney form allows us to carry forth this archetypal acknowledgement of the darker side of the collective and personal psyche, navigating the unconscious dimensions of the personality in order to find a way through them. Understanding that not all humans are good and some are very evil indeed, not be the psychopaths. Now, how do Disney how, how do they, how do Disney corporations have altered these tales? May go some way in order to understand the neuroses in modern Western humans concerning irrational fears and anxieties used by the governments, religions, cults, and corporations to manipulate us. Disney, in this context, can be viewed as a kind of sort of psycho psycho I got a typo there a kind of psychological operation. I was really trying to type there, uh, yeah, a psychological operation, psyop of sorts and keep us in an infantile state dependent on the control structure and by extension to keep us safe from imaginary enemies. Now, very this is very good because this leads me to what I'm going to talk about next. This this thing to to control us and put fears into us and to put to put anxieties into us and make us fearful rather than training us as children or teaching us as children that fear is normal, that, that darkness is normal. And this leads me on to an article in the Israeli paper, Haaretz, or I don't know how to pronounce it, someone, my friend in Israel told me earlier on, Haaretz, Haaretz, 
it's apparently an Israeli, I've read this paper before, it's kind of not one of the, the more right-wing Israeli papers, but I have been told it does its fair share of propagandizing. Having said that, this is why I tell everybody to read and consider and learn from everything, because there was a phenomenal article in the paper, I think it's today's, episode, today's one, I'm not sure. Yes, it is. And it's all about the consequences of what has happened because children have been introduced to what how fairy tales really used to be. On that article, I posted a graphic I found somewhere, and I listed the website of what, what fairy tales used to really say, and how they really ended, and they weren't all sweetness and light, just like fairies were not. Fairies were evil in the Celtic condition until Disney came along and gave us Tinkerbell. In this article in Haaretz, Haaretz, stop, you're scaring the children. Fear is a cornerstone in Israeli education. How fear has become a necessary tool in justifying the status quo and fostering hostility towards all that is different. Now, this is an Israeli paper now, remember. <clears throat> Several years ago, I joined the students' trip to Poland for the ceremony that was held at the Mad- Majdanek concentration camp. The guide brought a large tape player. When I asked her she was t- why, she was taken aback. Students need music in order to cry, she explained. During the ceremony... At the big monument, the guide played songs from the Israeli musician Yehuda Holiniker's album Efer Ver Abak. The f- now, this is interesting too because she was playing music at a a Holocaust mor- memorial in order to change people's perceptions. Now, the rest of this article. I had it online earlier on, but I can't read it right now. But I'll basically tell you what the article went on to say. The article basically said on that it, Israeli education is completely built around the idea that everybody hates us. And everybody is an enemy. And by that, they will start by giving the Nazis. And then they will talk. And this is, you know, this stuff is true. It really does go on in the world. These darknesses do happen. There has been anti-Semitism and depression. But this is, again, like I was saying... Fear is a very good tool for controlling people. So therefore, they always have to live in fear, but it's played on an emotional sense to change dopamine levels and to change things in their brains like a, a cortisol, adrenaline, and norepinephrine. Put them in states of hypervigilance and fear and afraid of people and creating what they call a siege mentality. And this is basically how Israeli schools function. They teach them that you're going to be wiped out if you don't have the the Israeli state taking care of you. And this article is complaining about it, saying that we shouldn't be raising Israelis this way because it's damaging Israeli culture, because young Israeli people are missing out on opportunities to integrate and to, you know, assimilate with foreigners of other cultures who mean them no harm. And so it'd be great to... to, uh, to think that this is, you know, this kind of mentality spreads within Israel and actually embeds itself into the the control, into the the education control system, because the Israelis could probably, you know, they could probably, as a people, could probably actually, you know, enjoy the experience of their nationality better rather than living in a siege mentality. They would be able to, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to generalize a whole, whole race, a whole nation here. I know there's lots of Israelis who are not, you know, not locked up in this, but the school system there, the control system, very much wants Israeli young people to grow up with this siege mentality. And this is reflected in other cultures too. You'll see that, you know, like, uh, again, not to stereotype people, but you go up to places like Northern Ireland and you see these loyalist neighborhoods and they have Israeli flags for some reason and these kind of, these Protestant loyalist ghettos, pictures of King Billy. The, the curbstones are painted red, white, and blue. And the whole thing is that, you know, no Catholics allowed, no Fenians allowed, no Southerners allowed. And, you know, it's a siege mentality again. And generation of generations brought up fearing outsiders. I live on the island of Ireland. And I can go 100 miles from here to a neighborhood, and not even 100 miles, 40 miles to the nearest large town in Northern Ireland, which would be Enniskillen. And there'd be neighborhoods in there where the people are just not Irish. Their lifestyle would be British. They would not have any Irish TV stations or radio stations on their televisions or their car radio. They would never have read an Irish paper. They'd have only, and, and this, these would be like, you know, six or seven generations, more, 10 generation Irish. And they would be, 
raised British, you know, 50 miles from here. You had the same thing in South Africa, in the apartheid system. And you would have, you know, the, 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 the white Africanists lived the same way. And now the whole United States seems to be now being engineered in the wake of the introduction of the Patriot Act into this, into this stuff. They're being, they're, they're being conditioning people through the fear. And because adults were never exposed to the darkness of the world as children because they've, Disney has altered the fairy tales, changed the fairy tales and taken the heart often many fairy tales that we have like happy endings to like Snow White and Sta- Sleeping Beauty they had horrific endings often you know the, the heroes were killed and everything or the heroine died a horrible death and it's just to teach the children in times past that yeah shit happens and life doesn't have happy endings and yet war that was taken away from us by Disney and it's then further impounded upon us by like say the recent royal wedding between you know, Prince William and Kate Middleton. Look how similar that wedding was to a fairy tale. There's even a photograph going around of the wedding party and it looks just like a a scene from a Disney film. There's an an infantilization imposed upon modern humans and this infantilization tells humans that you must live in fear and you must always be like a child, a fearful child that has neuroses and you don't have to build then a prison camp. And this is, comes this ties in perfectly with Aldous Huxley and Aldous Huxley's idea of using the cinema and culture as the concentration camp along with medications. And that's in famous speech he delivered to Berkeley in nineteen sixty four, I think it was. The idea was you did not if you wanted to control society, you didn't have to you didn't have to have machine gun towers and, you know, as he said, the crude forms of uh, firing squads and gas chambers. You could have fears and irrationalities and anxieties. Anxieties are fears that never come true. They're what could happen. And we are so controlled by that, it's frightening. We are so controlled and conditioned by it. Now, the show is going to end. The live show is going to It's a shame because I'm only getting warmed up now. The show is going to, the live show is going to end soon, so I'm going to ask Steve to play a song, and then I'm going to continue for another hour after this, and that you'll be able to hear that on podcast. So those of you who stood by and listened to the show tonight, thank you very much. It's, it's you're wonderful. The numbers have been fantastic, and you know it's just getting better every week. But just the show, whatever reason it went off, it has, it has, you know. We made it. We made it in the end. And some of you got like 45 minutes or whatever it was of a show. So this is Thomas Sheridan of Philosophy Now. And I'm just going to let Steve play a song called The Human Spirit Song. Ironically, again, enough by Moving Mountains. And I will see you in podcast land and good night. <laughs>